Hello everybody, thanks for joining us for the next uh, video on the Beyond Coronavirus series. Uh, this week I'm joined by uh, Michael and Maxat from the equity team here at Dolphin. We're going to be looking a little bit at our um, changes in the equity portion of the portfolio that we have been making in the last month. Uh, we've titled this business models in a sort of post-COVID-19 world. Part of the idea of what we're going to be talking about is what, what businesses make sense uh, when we are re-emerging into the sort of new unlocked economy uh, and how that's starting to filter through into some of the changes that we have been making in the portfolio and we just wanted to talk you through a little bit about some of the rationale some of the stocks and the way that the different business models are interacting so uh thank you very much and without further ado we will kick straight on um i'm gonna ask uh, misha just to talk a little bit about this we've kind of these are the two baskets that we have resilient and recovery side by side. Uh, we've highlighted in green the stocks that are currently sitting into our portfolio. Uh, but Misha, any sort of top line thoughts that you want to, to chuck in at this stage? Yeah, so basically um, in the beginning, in March, we introduced uh, two stocks, uh, two baskets of stocks, uh, and we call this resilient and recovery baskets. So we invested on the uh, resilient basket uh, in much uh, because of uh, mostly it is IT stocks and uh, we have seen that uh, the uh, recovery uh, been led by uh, IT stocks and also one uh, rationale behind uh, that actually uh, the uh, coronavirus situation lockdowns uh, not heavily affect uh, the underlying earnings and uh, we was waiting for a while until started to uh, to invest in into names from our recovery basket. Why? So basically, it's very difficult uh, to uh, guess what kind of impact should be on earnings, how uh, long lockdowns are going to last. But now we started to see, to see some certainty. Uh, we started to see some data. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, we have invested in uh, stocks of Total, Volkswagen, Peugeot, Walt Disney, Walt Disney, and uh, it's not just random guess, but it's because we started to see uh, drivers and we think that the recovery gonna happen by some layers. And we uh, just trying to figure out what is the next layer of, of recovery gonna look like. So, so far uh, we have seen uh, three uh, layers of this recovery. So bet on oil price recovery later, in 2020 bet on uh, cars, uh, car sales recovery, which we already already started to see in China. And finally, uh, bet on uh, entertainment industry and how this industry will look like uh, after lockdown uh, will be uh, lifted. I was gonna say just uh, one thing from, from my side before we um, get some thoughts and input from Max. When we're looking at some of the sectors there, you'd anticipate in a recessionary environment that we're very quickly heading into that you know, discretionary consumer spending is one of the easiest portions for consumers to cut. And when you start looking at all of the stocks that we're holding that have consumer discretionary as their sector, but actually when you start to dive into it a little bit more, it very quickly becomes not so discretionary spending. You know, Amazon has been, I think, a little bit of a lifesaver for many of us who have been uh, locked up in some sort of isolation for the last couple of months, given the wide variety of goods that it's now providing. But even in the recovery side with Walt Disney as a communications company, I think some of these sector classifications are quite outdated. And that's kind of forced us from a business model perspective to look one or two levels deeper than the sort of top level categorization, especially given the different business models that Amazon has. Um, Max, if you were to sort of try and summarize the differences between resilience and recovery in a couple of sentences, how would you sort of try and uh, collate together the different characteristics of the firm? Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, it's a, it was a very good point on, on sector naming and the fact that it uh, doesn't really uh, reflect the business nature of these companies. Uh, but uh, in terms of summarizing the baskets, I would say we tried to apply a fair amount of common sense when choosing the companies and uh, resilient, I would probably put it as a um, basket for early deployment 
to get us through the pandemic and lockdowns and recovery is uh, at a later stage to uh, capture some additional upside and uh, returning to normality. But that's, uh, I think, bang, bang on from our side. Um, we've not got um, Ubisoft, which is sitting in the resilient basket, uh, which was, I think, one of the probably the more lively discussions that we had. I mean, we ended up doing a, an entire video on the, the, the video game sector because we're sitting in uh, EA and Tencent, which have been two incredible performers year to date. Um, if we sort of skip a little bit just on to performance from our side, um, Misha, talk us through what we've been doing uh, transaction-wise that's kind of led to that level of outperformance. Yeah, so uh, similar to the uh, way how market recover, it it been led by uh, information technology stocks uh, because of our portfolio being skewed towards this sector. Uh, so we managed to outperform the overall index because of what we seen so far is the actual uh, split between uh, uh, between stocks which managed to show outstanding performance and uh, out and, and stocks which underperforming the market. So on our side, we uh, so far was lucky enough to have uh, more uh, outperformers uh, because of again it was the easiest guess for uh, the uh, portfolio managers for investment managers because of uh, uh, the underlying earnings uh, was not keyed as much uh, and uh, so uh, this is why we uh, we've seen uh, overall uh, IT stocks have been doing much better compared to the rest of the market but again so now we also having um, uh, recovery side in our portfolios also so we uh, we uh, in, under our thematics we have roughly half sitting in into resilient side uh, mostly via information technology stocks but now i think that we also added adding quite substantially uh, on, on the recovery side. So now we're also having car manufacturers, um, oil producer, and also Disney, which also uh, sitting uh, un under, under actually a little bit under both, on the recovery and resilience side. Now I'm just gonna pop up the market performance slide uh, so that our viewers can see that alongside us, because I know that this is something that you have been focused on from your side, if you want to talk us through uh, your thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, you can spot that this um, recovery, um, recovery part for uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, uh, very similar to performance of our portfolio. Why? Because of, again, this is IT companies. We also have Amazon, we also have Google in our portfolios, and uh, the uh, character of this market recovery is that it's been led by uh, these uh, IT uh, giants. So we already touched this uh, in our previous video. So uh, one of the reasons is that actually these stocks is just really liquidity buckets. And once investors want to invest uh, quickly, uh, and obviously uh, at the situation which has been in late of March, uh, you want to invest uh, quickly and you want to have uh, ability to sell if something goes wrong and uh, these uh, large large cap IT giants, it's perfectly fit for this purpose. So, and uh, investors uh, prefer this. And uh, in March, I just, uh, rem ju just remember it was a um, liquidity crisis. And uh, when, when stocks been sold across the board, no matter what uh, fundamentals they have. So uh, the second reason, again, fundamental one. So earnings uh, was not hit. In some cases, e even can benefit from the current situation. So, and um, the, the trickiest point now is just um, un uh, get understanding uh, how uh, this market rally will go uh, wider. So uh, because we can expect this, these uh, stocks will, uh, feed the other uh, layer of market recovery. And our task is to figure out what is the next layer, what is the next layer. And uh, uh, first, uh, we, 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 uh, our first step into uh, recovery uh, 
uh, basket was uh, was um, bet on uh, oil price recovery. So, which I can just briefly explain uh, why it happened. So, um, if we um, can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so basically our, um, in, in, in the early of May, we published uh, uh, a note in which we uh, say, said that actually we expect an oil uh, will overshoot on the upside because of uh, in the first quarter we have seen even negative prices uh, for WTI because of obviously market was uh, shocked by uh, the amount of demand which and just uh, went out of the market, and now we expect that market expecting that market will be balanced in the second uh, half of the year. And uh, mm, of course, the inventories which was uh, built uh, over the uh, first quarter will pressure the market. But we uh, expect that after they uh, will be drawn, uh, the uh, oil price can. Can uh, can surprise us on this case uh, in, the, in on this case on the upside. So and uh, we went through the uh, oil majors and uh, just in attempt to find the one uh, which better uh, suit for the this scenario. So I, on this, I think Maxat can even better cover the uh, our thinking process behind the. Uh, be behind choosing uh, Tatal as the top pick for the sector. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, as Michelle just pointed out, we decided to focus on uh, big companies, first of all, because uh, in the current environment where we had uh, oil shock and also economic shock from the pandemic, uh, going to like choosing a small company with uh, weak fundamentals is, is too risky. Uh, so first of all, we... Um, limited our uh, investment universe for oil stocks within within the uh, big companies, majors, uh, and identified Tatal as the uh, most appropriate company to invest. Uh, it has a strong balance sheet. It's uh, uh, well run. It has uh, strong growth coming from its uh, projects across the globe. It has some diversification benefits from uh, liquefied natural gas projects. Uh, and also another um, very important point is that in the current environment uh, of uh, very low or in some countries even negative interest rates and uh, as a result, uh, low uh, fixed income yields, uh, a stable company that provides an attractive dividend yield uh, looks uh, even, even more attractive and Tatal uh, at the present moment has around 7 or 8% dividend yield. During the last results, they uh, did not cut it. Uh, this comes in comparison with uh, other oil majors, uh, such as Royal Dutch Shell. Uh, therefore, uh, combining all of these factors, we decided that Tatal would be um, a good investment in the present environment. You, you kind of touched on uh, a couple of interesting little aspects there, Max. And well done for sitting so patiently whilst me and Misha were going backwards and forwards on the equity markets. Um, the first one is, uh, I mean, as Misha said, we saw WTI front month go negative for the first time in history. But what we've seen is a kind of a, an adjustment in oil demand globally with the basically shutting down of borders, the um, complete lack of flights suddenly leading to a big dive of people not driving their cars, people not going on planes to the extent we saw a massive surplus. So part of the recovery basket, irrespective of the sector, is this going to be, have they got a strong enough balance sheet to survive through this lockdown process? Um, and that's kind of aspect number one. But what we're looking at with uh, Total is these huge macro dynamics of global oil supply, global oil demand, and which companies have the characteristics that we that we like. On the dividend point, and I'm bringing this up because this is kind of crossing over into a couple of other conversations that we're having, uh, and this is coming down to traditional asset class barriers. You know, normally in a, a sort of normalized market environment, we're sitting here having a, an equity conversation, and then there'd be another team having a fixed income conversation 
Whereas I think now we've seen a lot of those traditional boundaries starting to break down and some of the characteristics of Total are much more sitting in that stable, not expecting so much perhaps of a price increase, but using it more for a coupon dividend play. And we're kind of looking at things more from this uh, return generation versus uh, income generation perspective, uh, combined with uh, a forward looking change in consumer preferences. Now, I'm saying consumer preferences because I know what the next slide is. Um, one of the big uh, topics that we've been discussing here at Dolphin is on this change in consumer preferences. And we've been looking at uh, you know, how does this change how we buy our groceries um, in terms of how we're buying it, where we're buying it, and what we're buying it with. You know, part of the reason why we've got uh, Ocado in our UK portfolios, while we bought MasterCard and our global multi-asset, but different companies that have exposure to different parts of this chain of this migration to e-commerce that has been enforced on essentially consumers around the whole world. Um, now we're starting to move into this uh, sort of unlocking phase. And what we're seeing, and I'm just skipping across to uh, this slide, um, I'm just gonna hit on the graph on the right and then I'll let you guys uh, chip in as well. Um, one of the things that we're seeing is going to be this migration potentially away from mass transit until there's sufficient comfort by us less as consumers and more as workers uh, in that we're able to do our commute to work in a safe environment. The three of us are working from home, continuing to work from home, uh, and it's difficult to see how that's going to change without either safe commuting, mass transit, or personal vehicle. And what we've seen uh, from the uh, Apple's mobile phone data on an anonymous, anonymized basis is that the method of transportation that has come back the fastest by quite a while, quite a way is this idea of driving. So whilst we can't uh, factor the Chinese recovery directly across to Europe and say that it's going to be identical in terms of looking at some of the mobility moves and new car uh, sales, thinking that at some point people who have been going to work and have the ability to change their transit method to personal transit, i.e. cars, then that is going to be something that is going to drive uh, higher car sales going forwards when the sales rooms are back up and running again. And again, this comes back to what kinds of car companies do we think have the right uh, range of models and the right balance sheet to weather the downturn to take advantage of the upturn and upswing in consumer interest that we're going to see reflected sufficiently in the share price to warrant uh, and justify taking the risk from our side. It's interesting that uh, this uh, behavior is just actually contradicts to something which we've seen uh, the last, I don't know, 10 years when uh, we have seen rise of uh, sharing economy uh, when uh, people, especially young people, prefer to, uh, to, 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 to go for uh, cheap uh, Uber drive uh, rather than uh, to uh, have uh, a car and paying uh, monthly uh, fee on their credit. So it's it's different story and uh, uh, we can expect that uh, this uh, for some time can be reversed, this uh, tendency. And we already started to see this in China. So interestingly that uh, uh, the uh, car sales uh, recovering faster compared to the other uh, sectors. And we've seen almost V-shaped recovery in China already. So in, in, in April, uh, the car sales, uh, passenger vehicle, uh, car sales staying just uh, uh, minus 5.5 year on year, and it's sharp improvement compared to 79 percentage uh, launch in February, following uh, minus 40 percentage drop in in March. So uh, we can use this as a guidance and can expect uh, that uh, now with the, um, lockdown uh, easing uh, happening uh, uh, around uh, the Europe we can expect the similar path. And also uh, interesting to, to read commentaries from uh, Chinese uh, Volkswagen head, 
uh, Volkswagen is the market leader in China. And uh, his commentary was that actually uh, entry level uh, models are the winners in the first week of the of, of market return. Also, he uh, said that uh, uh, they've seen a lot of uh, first time buyers. So basically, uh, people who never had cars, they now considering to have a one because of they need to, especially after lockdown, they want to visit their relatives, uh, which may be living in, uh, in different towns and uh, uh, rather than go for train uh, trip or for uh, airplane trip, they want to maybe buy cheap car and, and, and move. And also, we could, could expect that people in Europe uh, going forward will prefer uh, maybe four, five, five hours drive uh, rather than uh, 50 minutes an hour flight. So, and this is why uh, it is actually uh, encouraging us to look at the uh, car sector in more details. We, uh, we invested already uh, in, in uh, stocks of Volkswagen and Peugeot last year, and we uh, bought them We fixed profits uh, later in 2019. And uh, now we just reassess our investment rationale, and uh, we uh, went through the uh, industry players and have chosen Volkswagen and Peugeot. And on this, I think Maxat will uh, comment why why it is these stocks uh, our top picks uh, yeah so the key two points i would say are efficiency and uh, leverage so if you look on the left hand side chart uh, Peugeot and volkswagen are among the most profitable european car makers uh, uh, their, their operating margin for 2019 was 6.2 and 5.8 percent respectively uh, this is for, for, for the company as a whole. If you look, uh, for example, within Persia at uh, core uh, auto operating margin, it's, it's even higher, I think, uh, closer to 8%. Uh, so th this, uh, the margin looks very attractive. Uh, but uh, another important point, um, especially in the current environment, is uh, company's leverage. And then if you look on the right-hand side chart, uh, Persia has net cash position. Uh, and Volkswagen's net debt to EBITDA is lower than uh, average among major car makers. Uh, so we feel comfortable investing in these two specific companies. We believe they provide attractive uh, exposure to, to, the re to the potential rebound. As previously shown, uh, that's already uh, happening in China and suggest that it, it may happen in Europe and uh, other regions as well. Uh, also, I would like to add that uh, within China, uh, I remember, Misha, you previously mentioned that uh, the recovery was favored for entry-level models uh, and uh, for high-end. And it, it makes sense in the current environment uh, that people would uh, prefer budget options uh, uh, and also, I think um, high-end uh, is attractive for to uh, people uh, who are you who are used to um, like luxury products, let's say. Uh, but then again, it's a uh, within within that space, BMW would be potentially a, a good candidate. But then uh, it's net that to the is a bit higher that uh, we are comfortable with, and uh, we just decided to go with Persian and VW as uh, as a more robust opportunities. And obviously, two companies that we're familiar with, uh, as we yeah. just said, having purchased and sold them uh, for nice profits for both of them in 2019. Okay, so we've got Total, given some of the macro uh, changes and impacts that we've seen over the last couple of months and sort of forecasting forward over the next four to six months. We've got Peugeot and Volkswagen based on changing uh, consumer patterns of uh, behavior uh, that we're expecting going forward. Uh, so neither of those have had to particularly change their business model. They're just quite conveniently suited and uh, you know being able to buy 
uh, Peugeot, Volkswagen, both sort of 20 to 30 percent down on a year to date basis is kind of coming to part of the heart of the recovery basket of buying uh, good, solid companies, but at price share prices that are significantly lower than they were pre COVID-19. But ultimately, people we believe are going to continue buying cars and potentially in greater numbers than before from a personal security perspective to some extent. Now we come on to the fourth uh, entry, uh, which five skipped through. So Disney is an interesting one because you can kind of argue that half of the company sits in the resilient basket and half of the company sits in the recovery basket. Uh, and because of that second part of it, we kind of ended up leaving it in a recovery basket and only going into it in the last uh, year or two, sorry, year or two, a uh, week or so. Um, but it is quite a diverse company from uh, entertainment, parks, or from a sector perspective, communications. Which one of you guys wants to kick off on uh, thoughts and perspectives on Disney? Basically, uh, we added uh, Disney at first place uh, when we was forming our uh, recovery basket and still was keeping this uh, company in, in into the basket uh, because of, uh, as a reminder, we, uh, we, we, we included some stocks uh, in our recovery basket. Uh, it was airlines also, but as we started to see how this um, situation developed, we actually changed uh, the stocks and we excluded airlines and added uh, uh, in other names. So, but Disney was uh, sitting in our recovery basket from the very beginning. And uh, the one thing which prevent us to step in uh, earlier is that actually they have uh, parks uh, and entertainment segment uh, which uh, accounts for 34 percentage of revenue and uh, also uh, take 80 percentage of the uh, overall capex uh, but this uh, segment uh, was hit severely and uh, we um, was waiting for the company to uh, to start reopening or at least publish plans for reopening and uh, also uh, what was puzzling us is uh, what is the um, uh, what is the uh, occupation rate uh, should be reached uh, for this segment uh, to be break even? So, and we roughly estimated that actually it should be 50 percentage uh, when the uh, segment will be break even. So now we uh, started to see uh, the uh, recovery uh, the reopening started. Uh, in, in, in uh, Shanghai uh, Disneyland uh, and uh, now although it limited by 30 percentage capacity uh, we uh, thinking that uh, we uh, not like going forward within several months we can reach this uh, break-even for the segment and on the positive side uh, Disney uh, has Disney Plus so on which I think uh, I will pass on to Maxat to explain uh, these uh, pluses for, from which can get Disney from the uh, streaming segment. Did you just say you're going to let Max that explain the plus of Disney Plus? Yes, plus of Disney Plus. So <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of, lot of pluses, I would say, <laughs> within Disney, but Disney Plus is probably the strongest uh, growing and the most promising asset. Um, so first of all, they have reached almost 55 million subscribers uh, and looks like they will reach their guidance of 60 to 90 million by the end of this year, which means four, early, four years earlier than initially anticipated. Uh, and uh, if you think about uh, entertainment industry uh, today, content is, uh, is key. It's, uh, it's almost everything. Uh, I would probably say. And uh, if you look at the content that Disney has, uh, its intellectual property uh, portfolio is uh, one of the biggest, one of the oldest. Uh, it's well recognized by people uh, ac across the globe by, by I, I, would, I think, probably children in almost every country know at least some uh, Disney characters. 
so it's a very strong asset. It, it shows an exceptionally strong growth and the outlook for, for the segment is, is very strong. Um, and in terms of parks, uh, uh, I would also like to add that, um, so we've seen uh, Shanghai, Disney, Disney uh, Land reop uh, it, it reopened in May and uh, the tickets were sold out in just three minutes. So it just shows that there is a pent up demand and people are actually willing to go there and uh, spend time with their children. So it's a, it's a very positive sign. Uh, I think the consensus for US parks to reopen as of now stand in July. Uh, but overall, uh, the question of parks reopening uh, is a question of when, not if. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was gonna say, Max, you, you said I think content is key. I had written down content is king. Um, so it kind of shows some of the similarity of thinking. But this kind of look, when, when we're, we've been talking a lot about this, this concept of entertainment. Um, when we were creating the thematic initial baskets back in 2019, so sort of way before COVID-19 was uh, even a word that any of us thought that we'd be saying dozens, if not hundreds of times this year, um, one of the things we we're looking at was the staples of what we need as humans, and it was food, water, and shelter. That was kind of pre-lockdown. In lockdown, I think we have to add entertainment to that. And we've been, we, you know, we spoke about in the video games uh, part, how actually video games are a very good uh, cost efficient or sort of economical way of entertain uh, providing entertainment. Um, and we kind of have to add Disney into that just because of the franchises that are involved because as you said there's there's not many people around the world that haven't heard of some form of Disney characters because it's got a hugely long history and an incredibly impressive collection of films characters and series and that's uh you know the acquisition of Star Wars uh, sort mm -hmm. of fits into its portfolio quite quite nicely and as we're starting to look further forward from a business model perspective as well. Um, I think what we've seen from a consumer perspective is, you know, just in time inventory is something that's struggled over the last two months, just in time from a consumerism perspective, people don't want to wait two hours to watch the film that starts. They want to watch the film when they want to watch the film. It's the same idea of playing a video game and you know, what Disney is bringing with Disney plus is that sort of, on-demand ability to access this huge component of their back catalog. Now we've got lots of different uh, entertainment options. We were looking at different video games providers in the same spaces. Disney kind of have Netflix as another example, but I don't think that there's any company really that can compete with the, the depth and the breadth of this uh, back catalog that Disney has. Yeah, it's true. For parents, it's, a, it's another story because then you have your Sky subscription, you have your PlayStation or Xbox, then you have your Disney and your Netflix and your Amazon, and it just kind of adds up and adds up and adds up. Um, but I think Disney is going to be one that's going to be difficult for parents to turn down, as we've seen with the uh, shy of 55 million um, subscriptions that they've had in the couple of months, essentially. Okay, so uh, that's from our side, four different stocks, three different sectors, essentially three different reasons. Um, I'm just going to uh, share the slide deck again because I'm gonna go back to the beginning, um, you know, bring, it, bring it full circle before we end. Um, I'm just looking at the recovery basket and you know, we, we've been speaking a little bit about uh, you know, Dell Technologies as a beneficiary of uh, what we're all doing in terms of providing technology to enable us to work from home. Um, LVMH, which I think is a very, very interesting play, uh, you know, because one of the other conversations we we're having was this idea of the, the transaction uh, and there are a huge number of transactions that you can move to e-commerce, but not all of them. And uh, Interestingly, buying a car was one of the ones that we discussed as not being something that you could really easily do online. Um, and hence why when we're looking at car showrooms starting to reopen why we're buying Peugeot and Volkswagen. But also when you're looking at the luxury arm and so much of the transaction 
is about the experience rather than the implementation or execution. Um, and then we're starting to spread our wings into different sectors and different geographies. When we stand back and we look at essentially in front of us, all of our equity exposure, and we've got an incredibly diversified uh, group of companies here that are reaching out into the world and engaging with consumers uh, in lots of different ways. But on the resilient basket, we've seen uh, incredibly impressive performance coming through, dating back to the start of the year when we're looking at what Amazon's done on a year-to-date basis, massively contrasted with the performance of the recovery basket. Um, if you could pick uh, one stock in there going forward that you think is going to be the best performer between now and the end of the year, uh, what would you be uh, looking at personally, just out of interest? So um, it's a tough question because of, uh, especially from a uh, resilient basket, a lot of stocks already performed uh, quite nicely and uh, one stock up 40% uh, uh, year to date is just uh, very difficult to expect that it gonna perform, the performance going to look like this uh, going forward. Uh, so I would actually go for uh, a recovery uh, basket. Uh, so it, I struggle to pick one. Actually, I have several stocks which I like. So first of all, it is Adidas. So uh, it's again, so company which uh, sitting uh, on both sides at the same time. So. Uh, it's obviously get hit from uh, coronavirus uh, lockdowns and because of the uh, they selling uh, consumer discretionary goods and uh, retailers been closed. But uh, the company actually well positions go position going forward because of they already been selling around 11 percentage online and actually this uh, distribution channel. Uh, more profitable because uh, they don't need to share their margins uh, with uh, retailers. And uh, I can expect that uh, now, as we started to see uh, lockdown, uh, after lockdowns, uh, reopening stores, they can get boost from uh, traditional channel, but also this 11 percentage uh, e-commerce uh, sales can go up substantially. And again, this is more marginal uh, sales. Uh, I'm not going to allow you to say any more, Misha, because you're going to start telling us about five other stocks that you want to buy that you think are going to do really well. A, yeah, we're, I mean, a, a, we're running out of time, and B, I said one okay. stock. Yeah, okay, okay. You're, so, you're, you're stuck with Adidas, and now I want to hear from Max Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know which stock will perform the best until the year, but from a uh, business operations perspective, the most interesting to me uh, is probably DocuSign and the rationale behind it is uh, my view is so similar to online groceries where people suddenly discovered uh, that uh, doing grocery shopping online is, is very convenient. I think uh, digital signatures are also an interesting and also convenient concept. Uh, and for, for, I guess, a lot of businesses, uh, it was the only choice when we were under lockdown. Uh, I know even uh, within our company, we are using the services. So I would, uh, I haven't looked uh, into the DocuSign on a very deep level, but uh, that's an interesting company to me. Well, I'm, I'm gonna um, pump actually for, for Disney, um, mainly because we've seen quite a negative uh, share price reaction initially given part closures. I think we bought it at a reasonable discount to where it was trading in February. But uh, as uh, you guys were saying, you know, two, three minutes to snap up the available park tickets shows the demand out there from the consumers. Having achieved, call it 95% of their target subscriptions uh, within sort of four months rather than four years or five years shows the demand is there for the content side. And then the other interesting aspect is going to be the, the live sports and what they start thinking about um, when they're looking down that route. But I think for me, Disney is going to be a, an interesting one. Um, and we'll, we'll look back at, uh, at the end of 2020 and uh, see, see who came closest. Thank you for 
joining us today. We hope we've kind of given you a couple of things to think about on some of the stocks and the reasons why we've been going into them on the recovery basket side. Obviously, equity markets broadly have been continuing to push higher. Uh, we're questioning at our end how much uh, further capacity there is for them to grow, um, given the fact that it's a move on liquidity, not on fundamentals, as Nisha was mentioning at the beginning. Um, we have our next monthly investment update, which is on Tuesday, the 9th of June. We are going to be addressing this issue in a little bit more detail. So please feel free to join us then or watch the video replay. Uh, and then we have got later on in June, uh, the next of our impact series, which our colleague Annie will be hosting. Uh, thank you for joining today. And if you have got any questions, please feel free to reach out to me directly or to our uh, excellent marketing team who will guide you further. Thank you very much.